So let's get started for today's lesson. Today we have Shuang Yu for us to give us a lesson on the Mechtronics, the sensors. Uh, let's welcome Shuang Yu to proceed with this uh, lecture. Shuang Yu. Hello, Bowen. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, so let's start. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I'm Shuang Yu Yu. I'm provider hostel for another PhD student. And today we will have a, a lecture about sensors. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, there are a lot of sensors have been used uh, in the mechatronic uh, systems. So today is a, a very large topic, but uh, uh, because it's the course of the introduction of robotics, so I will try to uh, introduce a, the more type of, of types of uh, sensors, but not uh, reveal them into detail. Uh, the first part is about the sensor introductions. Uh, uh, what's a sensor? A sensor is a device that measures a physical uh, quantity, uh, such as a mechanical force, sounds, light, and converts it into a signal that can be interpreted by a processor. Uh, like our human being, our brain is like a microcontroller, and our ear, our eyes, our uh, toes, our uh, tusks, and fingers or skins, all of these are kind of the sensors. Uh, and uh, we use these sensors to uh, interact with the outside the environment, uh, and our brain can process this data and uh, generate some feedback to the environment. Uh, uh, in a mechatronic system, uh, our uh, CPU or the, uh, the microcontroller, uh, it's work like, uh, work like uh, our brain. And we have different type of sensors which can uh, uh, get the data, uh, such as the camera, like our eyes, uh, uh, electric micro microphone, uh, like the uh, nose, uh, the to electric nose can match uh, the uh, sensor the smell, and some uh, sensor the taste, sensor the touch. Or of course, in the mechatronic system, it can also sensor sensors for the the force, the position, or uh, temperature, or all the other things. Uh, so the uh, there are. Uh, primary uh, five type of sensors. Uh, the first is the resistive sensors, uh, such as the potential meters or uh, spring gauge, uh, G U A G, uh, and the uh, capacitive sensors or inductive sensors, or the piezoelectric sensors, or the optical sensors. Uh, the key uh, technology or key working principle of the sensors is to use some uh, resistance cap capacitor, uh, inductive or electric or optical to sensor the outside performance and can generate it to a electrical performance and can be uh, uh, measured by the electrical circuit. And uh, the microcontroller can generate some feedback uh, or some control commands based on the measured data. Mm, like, this, uh, like this figure, uh, when uh, press the cylinder, we can generate some uh, the difference of the voltage and can be measured by the uh, multimeter or the other microcontroller. Uh, in our uh, Arduino start kit, uh, starter kit, uh, there have a lot of sensors, like this to the ultrasound, and this is for uh, uh, temperature and uh, uh, human humanoid. I don't know how to do this. Uh, and this is the the light dependent uh, resistance. Uh, and uh, uh, they uh, also have some uh, sensors. All of these are sensors. Uh, and uh, this blue. Uh, in the blue square is the anal analog pole sensors. So the there are two type of sense, uh, 
based on the output signal, there are two types of sen sensors. The first is the analog sensors, which can output signal in a type of analog signal. And uh, a second is the digital sensors uh, to output, output uh, data as a digital signal. The analog signal is uh, kind of the, from such, such as a voltage from zero, one, one volt, two volt, three volt, as a continuously. Uh, and for digital signal, it's only made by uh, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, and high voltage, zero, one, zero, one. Uh, so the, uh, the yellow uh, squares shows the example of the digital sensors and the blue square shows some example of the analog sensors. Mm, and uh, for analog, uh, for, sorry, for, for digital sensors, uh, we just use microcontroller can directly read the data, uh, the binary data, like the uh, low voltage, or high voltage, and uh, directly measure, uh, read the measured data. But for the analog data, we need to do some uh, analog circuit and some uh, processing to read the data. Uh, here's the uh, figure shows the sensing and the control of the architecture. Uh, we have a sensor, uh, like a screen gauge. Uh, it can convert the physical stimulus into an electric signal. And the signal uh, generated here, the raw signal, and it can use a, a signal analog signal conditioning uh, to generate a, a, how to say, a filtered and a signal, a reliable condition signal, and the signal will uh, pass through an amplifier to amplify to a large and clear signal, and this signal can be read through the microcontroller. And uh, this part is relative with the analog to digital converter in the microcontroller. And the microcontroller can, based on the, uh, obtain the data and uh, control the actuator. So in the end of this, uh, at the last section of this course, we will uh, briefly introduction some analog to digital converter or the digital to analog converter technology. Uh, here's the example or the figure of the serometer. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, the characteristic plot uh, is like the right figure. It shows uh, when the outside uh, temperature with the outside temperature increase, uh, the, res uh, the, the thermal thermometer resistance will hugely reduce. So if we can have a circuit to measure the resistance, of this sensor, we can uh, calculate uh, the corresponding uh, temperature to realize the temperature measurement. Uh, so by using this uh, thermometer, uh, we can have an example of, about this. The, the input is the even, uh, environmental uh, temperature. And through the thermometer, we can measure the output is the reading temperature. So from the for the sensor like this, uh, we measure we use the sensor to measure the uh, raw signal and use some signal conditioner to uh, take the signal from the sensor and then manipulate it into a condition which is suitable to either display or in case of the control system. And finally, we display or control or, or, or use the signal for the control with some display monitoring, monitor. Uh, so the signal conditioner, uh, the signal condition conditioning is a manipulation of an analog signal in such a way that it meets the requirements of the next stage of polar processing. Uh, this, uh, I, I use this slide is from uh, our another course called Advanced Mechatronics, uh, which is for uh, the, third, uh, the fourth grade student and uh, uh, graduate student. So I will 
I, I, I want to uh, briefly introduce this technology to us in this course. And I merged uh, uh, the digital and uh, analog sensors in this today's lecture. Uh, and here's the display system like, like this to no matter the the uh, uh, smartphones or just some uh, LCD screens or some um, LED LED screens. Uh, so the first the first part of uh, the sensors is to introduce the digital sensors. I will give a presentation about the encoder. Uh, the encoder sensor is a uh, to can measure the output uh, position and speed of the the motor uh, and uh, uh, you uh, measure the velocity and the position through counting pulse. So this figure shows the classification of the encoder uh, and based on the class, the output signal, a different type of output signal, it has two parts. The first, the uh, incremental encoder, and second is the uh, absolute encoder. Uh, the incremental encoder means uh, when the encoder, I mean the motor and the encoder rotate, uh, it will output some signal like this uh, to show the increment of the position. And the absolute encoder means uh, in a certain time, you can read the current uh, position directly. And based on the sensing technology, uh, we can use uh, the magnetic, optical, or laser technology to build some encoders. Mm, so the absolute optical encoders, uh, it's like, a, uh, like, like, uh, like this, it's a track. Uh, uh, using the multiple tracks, the combination of on and on off of the single track generates an absolute value for the position. Uh, a motor, uh, uh, the the this uh, how to say this? Uh, as a as power is turned on, the value of position is read from this track. So only need to read the track when needed. Uh, for example. Uh, if uh, in this uh, if the absolute encoder uh, optimal encoder in this position, and we can uh, in this position, so we can read this uh, different value of the twelve track. Uh, the black means zero and the white means one, so it can generate a uh, binary uh, sequences, and based on the this uh, this uh, binary binary data we can convert it to the current position. So if the disk has a 12 tracks, so then the resolution of this encoder is uh, 4096. So which means uh, when we put this encoder to our motor, uh, it, it can accurately classify the current, uh, the accurately measure the current position, uh, and per, per, per round, it can measure uh, 4096 different positions. Mm. Another uh, encoder is called an incremental optical encoder. Uh, it includes this uh, rotary disk with one track, uh, a light source, and uh, a, a light source and a detector. Uh, one this when this disk rotate, uh, this pattern interprets uh, the light uh, emitted onto the phone detector, photo detector, just generating a detect digital or pulse signal output. So uh, the, the phone sensor uh, will generate the signal uh, when the encoder rotate and the microcontroller can read the how many times uh, the disk rotate and how many times the uh, the signal be generated, and by measuring or by calculating the times of the rotate, 
the microcontroller can know the current uh, speed and uh, position. Uh, compare with the absolute encoder, uh, this uh, incremental encoder looks uh, with simple structure and the data generated with a serial form. And uh, uh, it can be used for the, both the rotor, uh, rotary direction and velocity. Uh, I have some video uh, uh, will we'll show to us in the end of today's lecture to introduce in detail about the uh, different types of encoder and the working principle. And uh, uh, the, these two encoders, uh, the in, in incremental encoder and uh, uh, absolute, absolute encoder, we use the optical encoder as an example. You can see this LED and uh, the photo sensor. And here we introduce another uh, uh, encoder with a magnet magnetics, which means it uses a magnet and the uh, how to say this, the mag magnet and the hole sensors. So it can measure the different uh, uh, magnetic field value and to verify the uh, current position. And this technology are well really used for uh, current uh, low cost and but high resolution uh, encoder uh, and have been well really used in the uh, actuation system, I mean, the motor and encoder system. Uh, the, the third part uh, is to introduce a, a, a analog si a sensor signal condition. Uh, for the last part of digital sensors, uh, we just uh, need to measure the data, which is already in binary condition. And uh, but uh, for the, all the other uh, and analog sensors, we need to do the sensor signal condition amplifier and some calibration and read the data last. And uh, analog sensors are well really used, uh, like to measure the force, the uh, torque, uh, temperature, or the curve pressure. Uh, uh, for the signal conditioning, uh, let, me see, let me try this slide. Uh, we, uh, I, would, I would like to introduce the, the Winston Bridge. It's a thing, uh, very common but high uh, performance signal conditioning circuit and they introduce the amplifier and they introduce how to do the analog to digital conversion. Uh, first, uh, let's from, start from a very simple, uh, simple uh, structure like the voltage divider circuit. Uh, for example, if we have a, a light, uh, uh, like a thermometer, like a, a, a thermal thermal stator, how to say that, the, the resistance uh, change the rise of the, the temperature. And we put this sensor into here and connect it to the circuit. It's a simple uh, voltage divide, divider circuit. And by uh, measure the here, the voltage of here, we can uh, we can measure the resist uh, resistance value of R one. But uh, but this uh, circuit. It's very highly nonlinear, uh, which means uh, when the sensor resistance increased uh, and the, the, the output voltage in, uh, decreased, and this circuit is uh, uh, this circuit is highly nonlinear non uh, and will cause the high uh, bias or the high error. Uh, give me a second. So the problem, because of the the large offset voltage, uh, can be cannot be uh because the the 
uh, for for example, uh, when we measure the the sensor voltage is four thousand ohms, uh, we measure the output voltage is around one volt. Uh, we cannot amplify uh, this circ this is this voltage uh, because the voltage is already very large. Uh, so the this, this circuit makes the resolution very low. And so it and it causes a low sensitivity, and some uh, which means the uh the the sister the, the resistor will the small change on the resistor cannot be detected by this circuit. Um, so based on this issue, uh, the current uh, solution is to design a differential uh, circuit like this. Uh, this is the the R two is the uh, R two is the analog signal, uh, analog sensor, and the R one, R three, and oh, sorry, sorry, the R X is the uh, is the resistor we want to measure, like our screen gauge, and all the other three sensor, uh, three uh, resistance uh, are used to, to generate this uh, electrical bridge. Uh, by using this circuit, it can using the electrical bridge to balance the principle to measure the unknown electrical resistance like the Rx. Uh, and by using this kind of the circuit, it can uh, extremely uh, increase the measurement accuracy and make it uh, the system uh, linear. Mm, I use a example to show this into details. Uh, this is a screen gauge. And uh, when we, uh, uh, and it will put to the items we want to measure, the tension will cause the resistance increase in this direction. Uh, and the, uh, and the comp comp compression will cause resistance decrease in this direction. So uh, we put this uh, screen gauge sensor to our circuit and these two, this two types, uh, these two uh, pins are connected to the uh, circuit. The resistance can be measured through the windstone bridge uh, like, this, like this circuit. Uh, Sorry. So, so for the uh, screen gauge sensor, uh, it uh, can be measured uh, the sensor data through this. Uh, it's called a counter bridge uh, circuit. But in our real world, uh, uh, such as the high accuracy uh, six dimensions low cell. Uh, we always use the full screen gauge to measure the one uh, uh, full screen gauge, like one sensor to, in, to increase the uh, accuracy, such as this, with a, a pair of the low cells. We put it here, 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 and here to measure the uh, Com compression and extension force of these components. Mm. So we want to highlight that uh, uh, by using the differential circuit, like the differential voltage circuit, like the windstone bridge. Uh, it's a windstone bridge. It's a very common but a useful method to measure the uh, analog signal and to uh, with higher accuracy. And the output is pretty uh, linear, which means uh, it can be uh, measured continuously and always in the high resolution. 
Mm, and uh, the other part is uh, by using this circuit, uh, we can measure the, the very small compression and tension uh, with you know, high accuracy. And this signal can be uh, amplified through the amplifier to uh, let the microcontroller read the data. Uh, Uh, the last part is the uh, uh, converter. Uh, the converter is to uh, convert the sensor signal through the digital uh, data to the analog data or through analog data to digital data, uh, which have been widely used in the uh, mechatronic system. Uh, the first, uh, we I would like to introduce the analog and digital converter, uh, converter pro uh, procedure uh, here. Uh, we have a sensor, and we use Winston Bridge to do the signal conditioning, uh, analog, analog signal conditioning, and uh, use the amplifier to amplify the uh, measure the voltage, and can generate a, a analog voltage here. But how our microcontroller can read this data? For example, if we measure the current uh, compressor and present in the data uh, in the voltage about uh, such as three three point seven seventy uh, three point seven two volts, uh, how the microcontroller can read three point seven two? It should use the analog digital converter to convert the three point seven two into a uh, binary. Uh, binary uh, data. Uh, the terminology of the uh, analog to digital conversion is the uh, analog signal is continuously valued signal, such as the temperature or speed with finitely the possible values in between. And the digital uh, signal is kind of the discretely valued signal, uh, such as the integer encoder in binary. Uh, and the analog to digital converter, uh, which also called ADC, AD, A2D, uh, it can convert an analog signal to digital signal. Mm, the analog signal uh, is directly measured, uh, measurable quantities in terms of some other quantities. For example, like the thermometer we just introduced, uh, the mercury heat rate uh, raises as temperature raises. Oh, like a car speed meter, uh, as needle moves farther right as you are uh, accelerate. Uh, the digital signals, digital signals less, uh, has only two states. Uh, for digital computers, we refer to binary states like zero and one. One can be on or high level voltage like five volt, and zero can be off or the low level voltage like a, a zero volt. Uh, so some examples of the digital signal is like the uh, light switch can be either on or off of your LED light, or a door, uh, your host, uh, the door uh, to a room is either open or closed. Uh, so the principle of the analog to digital converter is like this. Uh, the, the basic principle of operation is to use the compar comparator principle to determine whether to turn on or particularly bytes of the binary number output. Like we have an input about uh, a 3.72 volt voltage. Mm, we use a, a series of eight lines uh, compar uh, co comparator mm, and through the, the encoder system, we can generate the binary output here. Mm, the, the resolution depends on how many comparator we have. The, with higher uh, number of com comparator, the higher input uh, uh, signal can be higher accuracy, a uh, uh, resolution of the input signal can be converted to the 
binary output. Uh, so for a uh, eight lines to three line priority encoder, it can only uh, measure the input signal with uh, eight different uh, condition. So, uh, sorry, uh, with, for example, we, when we use the Arduino Uno, Arduino Uno is a very simple and uh, uh, low performance uh, microcontroller, but it still has uh, 10 bytes, oh, sorry, eight bytes uh, for the analog uh, signal, uh, analog uh, uh, signal uh, bytes, which means it can have the eight bytes of the output binary and can measure the voltage uh, with relative high accuracy, like eight bytes is uh, 256 uh, the resolution. Uh, so the resolution and the accuracy of the ADC, the resolution equal uh, for the n bytes uh, comparator or n bytes microcontroller, the resolution equals uh, two of n squared. Uh, the minimum measured voltage equals to the voltage rent divided the resolution. For example, uh, with a zero to five voltage analog uh, analog voltage con converter to digital signal through a ten bytes ADC converter, the resolution is one zero two four uh, one thousand and twenty four. So it means the minimum measure of the voltage is used five volt divide the 1024 is equals to 4.88 uh, uh, MV, which means for example, if you have a, a voltage here, like 3.72 uh, by using the 10 bytes uh, uh, microcontroller, uh, as the ADC, uh, you can measure it here, like uh, with uh, this uh, resolution. So compare with using a, a very, uh, for example, compare with using a three bytes a microcontroller, it can uh, only the minimum measure the voltage is uh, five divided eight. It's pretty high, so with the higher with more bytes of the microcontroller, the higher uh, accuracy you can measure through the ADC circuit. Uh, and the last part uh, I would like to introduce uh, is a digital to analog converter. Uh, this um, are not typically used in the sensor technology, but uh, used uh, uh, but uh, most uh, be used for the control. Uh, so when you, uh, when the microcontroller can read the sensor data, uh, mm, it won't, uh, how to generate the analog control profile, uh, control profile, like uh, to control the actuator, you need to convert the digital value to analog value, uh, analog value. Mm. A digital to an analog converter, also called DAC, DA, D2A, or D2A, uh, is a system that converts a digital signal into an analog signal. Uh, DACs are commonly used in some music players, TVs, cell phones, uh, to convert the digital data streams into analog audio signals. And uh, of course, in you know, use in the motor control, uh, like this, the controller generates the uh, output control profile uh, and convert the digital circuit, digital signal to analog circuit signal to the motor driver, and the motor driver can generate a certain uh, output, a certain voltage to the actuator based on the uh, analog uh, input voltage signal. Mm. Here's the example of the digital to analog uh, like uh, the Arduino PWM output 
have uh, eight bytes output. Uh, so uh, eight bytes can output here from the first byte to the eighth byte, D0 to D7. And by using an uh, eight bytes DSA circuit, it can generate the output uh, analog voltage. For example, the digital value of the binary data, like a zero, 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 uh, here, it will generate the voltage of zero. And for the digital value of uh, binary data like this, um, it will generate the voltage uh, is um, the this binary data is uh, uh, is correspond to sixty three and use sixty three times the minimum resolution uh, times this here minimum measured voltage times here you can get the uh, real time output voltage because it is a eight bytes uh resolution DAC, which means uh, uh, the uh, the eight bytes map the eight bytes binary data is from zero to uh two hundred and fifty five. So the two hundred and fifty five, which means the one 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 uh correspond to the five wall. We can generate five wall. Mm, so the summary uh about the analog uh, signal is uh, uh, mm, first uh, by using some certain circuit like a windstone break, uh, it can uh, measure the analog signal uh, from the analog sensor. Uh, and uh, after that, the small signal, the measured small signal can be amplified through the amplifier. Uh, this is another Mm, a little bit more difficult about the, the circuit uh, to a large signal, and the signal can be uh, converted through uh, analog to digital uh, circuit and be measured from, from the controller. And after that, the controller can generate some mm, mm, talk command based on the digital to analog circuit and use that signal to control the actuator eventually. Okay, so uh, after pre student presentation, uh, Bowen will help me to provide more uh, videos to introduce the encoder a uh, different type of encoders working principle, uh, the magnetic encoder, uh, and the screen gauge with uh, the working principle, uh, and uh, further introduce what is a uh, uh, low cell. Uh, low cell is to measure the torque of the uh, components. And give me a second. Uh, and uh, further introduce some advanced uh, sensors, like the initial inertial measurement units, which use the data fusion technology to measure the accelerometer, uh, gyroscope, and uh, uh, magnetic, mag magnet. Uh, and also some video about the uh, EMG sensor to mass measure the muscle activity. Uh, and the, the, some uh, the advanced technology to use the camera or inertial measurement units to measure the human motion. And the last video is uh, to introduce uh, how many sensors we use for a smartphone. Okay, that's all. Uh, thank you for your listening. Uh, Bowen? Yes, thank you, Sean, for giving us this lecture. Uh, so, which team is supposed to give this uh, presentation today? Okay, group one. Uh, group one, please turn on your uh, camera, please. And I think you can share your screen.
Uh, we can start. Yep. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we're Team One, and today we're going to tell you about how, uh, what we learned from the papers for sensors. All right, so what are sensors? A sensor is a device, module, machine, or subsystem whose purpose is to detect events or changes in its environment and send the information to other electronics. Most sensors are electronic, but some are more simple, such as glass thermometer, which presents visual data. A sensor can detect properties such as light, temperature, smoke, proximity, pressure, infrared, and much more. Uh, the image on the right is an ultrasonic distance sensor, which uh, which include which is included in a in an Arduino kit. It basically sends out ultrasonic waves to uh, detect distance or measure distance. Sorry, and they are seen everywhere. They're in your uh, there. You have automated cars uh, in your cell phone your camera. So going on to the next slide. Uh, next slide. All right, uh, we're gonna delve into the types of biomedical sensors. So the first one is a heart rate sensor, also known as a heart rate monitor. It is a personal monitoring device that allows a user to track and display his or her heart rate in real time or for study purposes. There are two ways optical and electrical that the sensor monitors your heart, uh, which are electrical. The first one is electrical. It consists of two elements, which are a monitor and a receiver. When a heartbeat is detected, a radio signal or coded signal is transmitted, which the receiver uses to display or determine the current heart rate. And the second is uh, optical. It, it uses basically uses a light that shines through a human skin, which will then measure the amount of light that reflects back. The light reflections will vary as blood pulses under the skin will go past the light, which are then interpreted as heartbeats. Our second is a galvanic skin response sensor. It, the gal galvanic skin response, or GSR, refers to a change to changes in sweat gland activity that are reflected of the intensity of our emotion emotional state. Skin conductance offer, offers direct direct insights into autonomous emotional regu, reg, regulation as it is not under conscious control. For example, if you're scared, happy, agitated, or any uh, emotional related response, you we will uh, you will experience an increase in sweat gland activity, which the sensor can pick up through the electrodes and transmit to the master device. Uh, the third is an Electromyography sensor. Electromyography is a method to evaluate motor unit action, uh, potential activity, and muscle region. As electrical signals travel through nerves to uh, neuromuscular junctions, the change in electrical potentials or voltage can be measured. And uh, the third, I mean, fourth, is a fingerprint sensor. Uh, we all know what that is. So a fingerprint sc sc scanner generates an image of the ridges and valleys that make up a uh, fingerprint. Next slide. Here, here are the challenges. Use of sensors for healthcare challenges. The use of sensing technology made a big impact on physicians' world. It led to the creation of new professions allied to medicine. It also had a big, a great impact on patients' healthcare experience. So doctors are able to provide their patients with the best healthcare they can provide. And um, examples are like monitoring the heart rate and blood pressure. The challenge is uh, to further improve healthcare experience a new sensing technology is needed. And the solution is the creation of novel ambulatory monitoring system. In other words, wearable sensor systems. Um, examples are the images to the right. Yeah, the images to the left, you can see sensing technologies, but these are more applied in uh, hospitals and uh, 
the thing about them is that they're not really they have a lot of wires and everything so it's hard to apply them in many different fields and uh, but the images to the right it is more manageable and more organized and uh, as you, when you're looking at them you can one can even wear them while, while running so it can be applied in, even outside of hospitals so even patients are able to check their own health the new technology can be used to monitor breathing patterns over an extended period of time to study respiratory disorders like chronic obstru obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease. This new sensing technology will lead to improvement in four groups of monitoring platforms, which are HUDA type systems, body worn sensor patches, body worn bands and harness, and smart garments. This will be explored in more details in later slides and other slides. Next slide. Use um, so use of sensors for motion tracking challenges. The challenge here is creating sensors for human tracking motion, human motion tracking. The solution is the creation of highly stretchable textile silicon capacitive sensor. As, a, as a, an example, is the image to the right. When you're looking at it, it looks like a regular glove, but when you take a closer look, there are sensors built into the built into the gloves. So these sensors can track um, can track the motion of the fingers within the glove. So when the pinky the pinky move is moved uh, is moved, the sensor can pick it up. Even the ring finger, the ring finger, and all the other fingers. So this sensor can be applied in human articulation detection, soft robotics, and exoskeleton. These sensors can be easily manufactured to produce a lot of large sensors, sensor man that can be shaped based on a random or personal choice using laser cutting. All right, next slide. So now we're gonna look into some applications with sensors um, and we're gonna be discussing a few medical related sensors. So first here we have Holter type systems. So this system has a transmitter device that's attached to a belt, necklace or a waistcoat on a person. And we can see these examples that I just said on the images to the right. So the Holter system has regular ECG sensors, which are primarily used to monitor someone's heart activity. It's very useful for detecting arrhythmia, which is also known as irregular heart rate. The Holter system is typically used for several days in order to conclude any health concerns and issues. And we can see one clear disadvantage as Abdul said in the previous slides is that there are a lot of wires and this takes up a lot of space on a person's body. So it essentially limits a person's actions. And certainly we can see that if there's a disabled person that has to use this, they're at a clear disadvantage. Now moving forward to the next slide, we're looking at another application of a health inspired sensor. And this one is a wrist worn sensor. So these watch-like devices contain built-in integrated sensors. Some examples of sensors that are in such of these devices are a hematron sensor, which is responsible for sensing skin blood flow movement, skin temperature sensor, a skin potential sensor, and finally a heart rate sensor. So once all of these sensors usually collect their data, they can monitor the results and actually compare the correlated data to infer human emotional and sensory actions. Two specific risk-worn technologies that can do so are seen on the images to the right. The more interesting one is the one on the bottom. This is called an Exmovir, commonly known as the telepath. So this device contains all the sensors listed above, but one cool thing it can do is actually send to a caretaker or a parent the data through Wi-Fi or SMS. And this is done through integrating appropriate communication modules into the wrist device. So compared to the last application, this one is more compact than the Holter system and it can reproduce many more results. So this is an innovation seen in the applications of sensor technology. Moving forward into the next slide. 
here we see we have smart garments. And this is a peak example of how far sensor technology has come. The sensors in smart garments are made out of fabric. The image to the right shows the wealthy shirt designed by Smartex. The sensors included in this shirt include fabric ECG electrodes, fabric impedance electrodes, an embedded temperature sensor, and finally piezoresistive fabric sensors which are sensors used to indicate change in electric resistance due to stretching the material. All the fabric sensors listed are connected through knitting the materials so they have sufficient contacts where necessary. This shirt in particular is able to monitor ECG, respiration, posture, core body temperature, and body movement index. Moreover, utilizing sensors with such ergonomic materials provides a stepping stone towards monitoring necessary information to benefit people. Moving forward to our final application, we'll be discussing Elon Musk's Neuralink brain sensors. So the top right image shows Neuralink's Link version 0.9, which is a small sensor that could be attached to a person's brain to send signals to make someone perform a certain action. This is achievable because the brain's neurons are responsible for all actions and thoughts from the mind. So when someone thinks or wants to perform an action, the brain's neuron sends electrical pulses from one to the other until an action is complete. So using a method called two photon microscopy, the Neuralink sensor is able to mimic what the brain naturally does with electric charges from one neuron to the other. Now to prove that this is reliable, Elon Musk uh, did a demonstration and we'll see that video on the next slide. Uh, what I'm excited to show you, um, I call it like the, the, the Three Little Pigs demo. Um, and uh, if our uh, animal handlers we bring, bring out the, the pigs, and what we're going to show you is a, well, I'll walk right over and show you. So what we have in pen number one is Joyce, uh, and she does not have an implant. <laughs> Obviously, healthy and happy. Um, <laughs> we're trying to get Gertrude out, and this is how you know it's a live demo. So here's Dorothy, um, and in the case of Dorothy, um, Dorothy used to have an implant, and then we removed the implant. So this is uh, an, a very important thing to uh, demonstrate, is reversibility. So if you, if you have a neural link, and then you decide you don't want it, or you want to get an upgrade, and the neural link is removed, um, is it removed in such a way that you are still healthy and happy afterwards? And what Dor Dorothy illustrates is that you can put in the neural link, remove it, and be healthy, happy, and indistinguishable from a normal pig. Oh, thanks, Dorothy. <laughs> Here we go. Great. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. This is a, a high-energy pig. Um, all right. Gertrude, thanks for coming out. Um, so what you're, the, the beeps you're hearing are real-time signals from, from the neural link in Gertrude's head. So this neural link connects to neurons that are uh, in her snout. So whenever she snuffles around and touches something with her snout, the, that sends out uh, neural spikes, which are detected here. Um, and so on the screen, um, you can see uh, each, each of the, the spikes from the 1,024 electrodes. And, and then if, you, if she, yeah, she snuffles around, touches this out in the ground, or you kind of feed her some food, pigs love food, um, then uh, you, you can see the neurons um, will fire much more than when you're not touching this out. And uh, that's what's making the, the beeping sound. All right, cool. So as you can see, uh, we have a healthy and happy pig, um, initially shy, but obviously high energy and, and uh, you know, kind of loving life. And uh, she's had the implant for two months. So this is a healthy and happy pig with an implant that is two, month old, two months old and working well. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> um, and then um, we actually have, I hope sure <laughs> this works, is, so we said, well, what if we do two Neuralink implants um, and we've been able to uh, do uh, dual neural link implants 
uh, in, um, actually I think three pigs at this point, and we have a couple of them here. Um, and we've been able to show that you can actually have multiple neural links implanted, um, and again, healthy and happy and indistinguishable from a normal pig. So, um, so it's possible to have multiple links in your, in your head and have them all be sending out signals and be working well. All right, so we just showed you a demonstration of uh, reading brain activity. And um, let's see, you probably see that. Um, as I was saying, uh, each of those dots represents a neural spike. And the, um, the, the blue chart at the bottom is showing an accumulation of neural spikes in that region. So uh, in, in, in terms of additional uh, brain reading activity, uh, when we have, um, say, um, one of our pigs on a treadmill, <laughs> pig on a treadmill, <laughs> um, funny, funny concept, really. Um, and we uh, take the, the readings from the neurons and we try to predict the posi position of the joints. Um, and so we say we have the predicted position of the joints, and then we, we measure the actual position of the joints. You can see that they're almost exactly aligned. So we're able with um, a wireless neural, imp neural implant to actually predict the position of, of all of the limbs uh, in the pig's body uh, with, with very high accuracy. So after looking at that video, we can see that the neural link can successfully predict brain activity. And it's also been tested safely on animal test subjects. So ideally what the Neuralink could do is save the brain's electrical pulses. This could lead to creating a backup for people to save their memories and replay them if they're forgotten something. Or another radical idea Elon Musk put out there was that you can potentially save someone's memories into a cyborg. So now that we've discussed a few applications, we're going to move on to future works. Uh, uh, what I'm excited to show you. Okay. As shown, as, as shown in the previous slides, we know that sensors can be woven into shirts. In this case, MIT created a shirt that has sensors woven into it to monitor vital signs. These sensors can track temperature, breathing rate, and heart rate while also being comfortable to the user. These type of shirts are like compression shirts, like the ones you wear for exercise. And inside the shirt, there's 30 flexible strips that can be removed so the shirt can be washed. Uh, the data from the sensors can be transmitted wirelessly to phones. Uh, next slide. Um, as seen on the image in the top, you can see that there's uh, detachable wireless modules, so it could be easily washed, it's clipped on. Um, it, on the outside, it looks like a regular shirt, but on the inside, the sensors are visible, uh, shown in the picture on the bottom. And since the shirt covers a large area, uh, the wearers uh, can observe changes in different parts of their bodies, like their arms, chest, back, etc., for more accurate data. And they, these researchers hope to use this for personalized telemedicine for doctors to make better assessments for patients. Next one. This next project is also from MIT. Um, in this case, uh, the researchers create a flexible silicone sensor for soft robots which is inspired by Karagami, as shown in the top picture, um, which can be extended. Um, these sensors tell the robot motion and position data in a 3D environment, and they can be easily made with materials that you can easily find in labs. So almost every lab can have like the same system. Uh, their goal is to have the sensors attached on soft robot trunks, which you will see in the next slide. So the robots can control themselves automatically and pick up things and interact with the real world. Next slide. One, one of their future aim is to make artificial limbs that can more directly handle and manipulate objects in the environment. Um, the trunks, uh, this is a soft robot trunks that I was talking about. Um, the sensors have properties where they change in electrical resistance when strained. And 
they're pretty noisy, but the researchers filtered out the meaningful sounds uh, with the help of the actual robot. And this is used to predict movement and position while scientifically uh, comparing to actual ground truth data. Their next goal is to create and improve sensor sensitivity and improve flexibility. One of the researchers compared this to fingers and said, you can close your eyes and reconstruct the world based on feedback from your skin. And that's essentially, essentially what they're trying to do with these sensors. Next one. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, the sensors can be seen as a bridge for human and machine capability, allowing for robots and machines to be able to obtain senses and react in a way depending on what information it obtains, just like humans. Sensors are being developed even further, however, to not only work more for robots, but also to enhance human life by being able to further monitor what old sensors would do at a surface level. Even more so, now uh, with the implementation of soft robots, sensors are extremely versatile and a major key component to further soft robots goals of being human interactable. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, team one. Uh, that's a very good presentation. Uh, thank you very much again for showing us that. And now I'm going to show you something about the homework. And then we will watch some videos. Let me share my screen. Okay. So I think, can you see this? This looks weird. Yeah. Okay, so here is a, okay. So here is the homework for, you still have the same exactly uh, form of homework that you need to do. You read three papers and watch, sorry, not two videos, but one related video. And each group should record one presentation video about 15 to 20 minutes and online presentation in the class. Uh, that will be on November the 10th. And here are the papers, and this is the link. And you are required to upload your uh, videos to this link. The deadline is November 9th and 11 before midnight. And I will upload the papers to your Dropbox shortly after this class. And now let's start it with this encoder video. Oh, sorry. Previously, we discussed what an encoder is and how it can be implemented. Can you guys see this? Uh, yes. Uh, quick and it in your application. In this video. Yeah, sorry. You uh, said you have a quick question. Yeah, quick question. Uh, was that work for modulars? Yeah. Okay. Video. We are going to discuss the various types of encoders and which encoder may be used for which function. Before we get started on today's video, 
If you love our videos, be sure to click the like button below. Then make sure to click subscribe and the little bell to receive notifications of new RealPars videos. This way, you never miss another one. There are many types of encoders, but they basically fall into two main sensing techniques, those being linear and rotary. Within those categories, there are differing encoder measurement types, such as absolute and incremental. There are also various electromechanical technologies, such as magnetic, optical, inductive, capacitive, and laser, to name a few. There is a plethora of information regarding encoders, and it may seem hard to wrap your head around it. Descriptions like rotary or linear, optical and magnetic, absolute and incremental. We touch on a few basics to help you understand what's what and why. Let's first break these categories down a little and explain. And encoder would be an incremental change. Position encoders are widely used in the industrial arena for sensing the position of tooling and multi axis positioning. The position encoder can also be absolute or incremental. Optical encoders interpret data in pulses of light, which can then be used to determine such things as position, direction, and velocity. The shaft rotates a disk with opaque segments that represent a particular pattern. These encoders can determine movement of an object for rotary or shaft applications, while determining exact position in linear functions. Optical encoders are used in various applications, such as printers, CNC milling machines, and robotics. Again, these encoders may be absolute or incremental. After explaining the main groups, you may be seeing a pattern. All the encoders basically do the same thing, produce an electrical signal which can then be translated to position, speed, angle, etc. Now that we have broken down the main groups, let's discuss the difference between absolute and incremental measurements. To discuss the difference between absolute and incremental measurements, we will use the rotary encoder type as an example. In a rotary absolute measurement type encoder, a slotted disk on a shaft is used in conjunction with a stationary pickup device. When the shaft rotates, a unique code pattern is produced. This means that each position of the shaft has a pattern, and this pattern is used to determine the exact position. If the power to the encoder was lost, and the shaft was rotated, when power is resumed, the encoder will record the absolute position as demonstrated by the unique pattern transmitted by the disk and received by the pickup. This type of measurement is preferred in applications requiring a great degree of certainty, such as when safety is a primary concern, because the encoder knows, at all times, its definitive position based on the unique pattern produced. Absolute measurement encoders can be single-turn or multi-turn. Single-turn encoders are used for measurements of short distance, while multi-turn would be more suitable for longer distances and more complex positioning requirements. For incremental measure encoders, the output signal is created each time that the shaft rotates a measured amount. That output signal is then interpreted based on the number of signals per revolution. The incremental encoder begins its count at zero when powered on. Unlike the absolute encoder, there are no safeguards regarding the position. Because the incremental encoder begins its count at zero in startup or power disruption, it is necessary to determine a reference point for all tasks requiring positioning. In the previous video, when describing the use of an encoder for the purpose of counts, that example is a good example of an incremental encoder. Assume that the power has not been disrupted, and you have turned on the conveyor, 
and place the machine in setup mode. As the encoder is turning, the controller is receiving counts. Let's say the count range is 0 to 10,000. This is an incremental encoder, so the absolute position is not known. We just know that a full revolution of the shaft registers a count of 10,000. We'll place the object on the conveyor, and as soon as the entrance photo eye sensor detects the object, the current encoder count is captured. Let's say that number is 5,232. We will then capture the count with the object exiting and being detected by the exit photo eye. We'll say that the number is 6,311. So to determine the count of the full travel, we will subtract 5,232 from 6,311 and determine that the object travel is 1,079 counts. By this example, it is obvious that we do not know the absolute location of the object. We just know that the travel count from the entrance to exit is 1,079. That doesn't tell us that the object is 3 inches from the exit, just entering, etc. We just know that the object will enter, a count will be captured, and the object will exit, and again, the count captured. In the event that we did not see the object exiting within the allowable travel count, plus or minus a dead band, the machine will fault and the process will stop. There are many, many encoder variations out there, and we could go on for hours about the varying types. Hopefully, we have given you a basic understanding of what's out there, and when you may want to choose one particular type over the other. Want to learn PLC programming in an easy way? Hello, Dan Rilski here from howtomechatronics.com. In this video, we will learn what is Hall Effect and how Hall Effect sensors work. The Hall Effect is the most common method of measuring magnetic field and the Hall Effect sensors are very popular and have many contemporary applications. For example, they can be found in vehicles as wheel speed sensors as well as crankshaft or camshaft position sensors. Also, they are often used as switches, MEMS compasses, proximity sensors and so on. Now we will go through some of these sensors and see how they work, but first let's explain what is the Hall effect. Here's the experiment that explains the Hall effect. If we have a thin conductive plate as illustrated and we set current to flow through it, the charge carriers would flow in a straight line from one to the other side of the plate. Now, if we bring some magnetic field near the plate, we would disturb the straight flow of the charge carriers due to a force called Lorentz force. In such a case, the electrons would deflect to one side of the plate and the positive poles to the other side of the plate. This means if we put a meter now between these two sides, we will get some voltage which can be measured. So, the effect of getting a measurable voltage, as we explained above, is called the Hall effect after Edwin Hall, who discovered it in 1879. The basic Hall element of the Hall effect magnetic sensors mostly provides very small voltage of only few microvolts per gauss, so therefore these devices are usually manufactured with built-in high-gain amplifiers. There are two types of Hall effect sensors, one providing analog and the other digital output. The analog sensor is composed of a voltage regulator, a Hall element and an amplifier. From the circuit schematic we can see that the output of the sensor is analog and proportional to the Hall element output or the magnetic field strength. These type of sensors are suitable and used for measuring proximity because of their continuous linear output. On the other hand, the digital output sensor provides just two output states, either on or off. These type of sensors have an additional element, as illustrated in the circuit schematic. 
that's the Schmidt trigger, which provides hysteresis or two different threshold levels, so the output is either high or low. For more details how the Schmidt trigger works, you can check my particular tutorial for that. An example of this type of sensor is the Hall FX switch. They are often used as limit switches, for example in 3D printers and CNC machines, as well as for detection and positioning in industrial automation systems. Another contemporary applications of the Hall FX sensors are measuring wheel speed or RPM, as well as determining position of crankshaft or camshaft in engine systems. These sensors are composed of a hole element and a permanent magnet, which are placed near a tooth disc attached on the rotating shaft. The gap between the sensor and the teeth of the disc is very small, so each time a tooth passes near the sensor, it changes the surrounding magnetic field which will cause the output of the sensor to go either high or low. So, the output of the sensor is a square wave signal which can be easily used for calculating the RPM of the rotating shaft. Thanks for watching and for more tutorials visit my official website howtomechatronics.com A lot of people have the morning routine of stepping on a scale to check their weight. What most people don't know is that they are using a very simple load cell to find out their weight. Old scales used to use weights to try and level out the two sides of the scale. Now we have methods that measure weight automatically. The first thing we need to know about a load cell is a definition of what we are talking about. A load cell is a force gauge that consists of a transducer that is used to create an electrical signal whose magnitude is directly proportional to the force being measured. There are four common types of load cells. They are pneumatic, hydraulic, strain gauge, and capacitance. Before we get started on today's video, if you love our videos, be sure to click the like button below. Then make sure to click subscribe and the little bell to receive notifications of new RealPars videos. This way, you never miss another one. Let's begin by looking at how a pneumatic load cell works. Since it is pneumatic, we know that it will deal with air pressure. A pneumatic load cell consists of an elastic diaphragm which is attached to a platform surface where the weight will be measured. There will be an air regulator which will limit the flow of air pressure to the system and a pressure gauge. Thus, when an object is placed on a pneumatic load cell, it uses pressurized air or gas to balance out the weight of the object. The air required to balance out the weight will determine how heavy the object weighs. The pressure gauge can convert the air pressure reading into an electrical signal. 
Next, let's talk about a hydraulic load cell. The word hydraulic should let us know that this load cell will work by using fluid, whether water or oil. These load cells are similar to pneumatic load cells, but instead of air, they use the pressurized liquid. A hydraulic load cell is consisting of an elastic diaphragm, a piston with a loading platform on top of the diaphragm, oil or water that will be inside the piston, and a Bordon tube pressure gauge. When a load is placed on the loading platform, the piston applies pressure to the liquid contained inside it. The pressure increase of the liquid is proportional to the applied force or weight. After calibrating the pressure, you can accurately measure the force or weight applied to the hydraulic load cell. The pressure reading can be read as an analog gauge or it can be converted into an electrical signal from a pressure sensor. The next type of load cell we will discuss is the strain gauge. This is the most popular style of the load cell. A strain gauge load cell is a transducer that changes in electrical resistance when under stress or strain. The electrical resistance is proportional to the stress or strain placed on the cell, making it easy to calibrate into an accurate measurement. The electrical resistance from the strain gauge is linear, therefore it can be converted into a force and then a weight if needed. A strain gauge load cell is made up of four strain gauges in a whetstone bridge configuration. A whetstone bridge is an electrical circuit that measures unknown electrical resistance by balancing two legs of a bridge circuit. One of the legs contains the unknown component. The whetstone bridge circuit provides incredibly accurate measurements. The strain gauges that are in the whetstone bridge are bonded onto a beam which deforms when weight is applied. The last type of load cell we are going to discuss is a capacitive load cell. Capacitive load cells work on the principle of capacitance, which is the ability of a system to store a charge. The load cell is made up of two flat plates parallel to each other. The plates will have a current applied to them, and once the charge is stable, it gets stored between the plates. The amount of charge stored, the capacitance, depends on how large of a gap between the plates. When a load is placed on the plate, the gap shrinks, giving us a change in the capacitance, which can be calculated into a weight. Now that we have discussed the different types of load cells, let's discuss some applications. The first application we are going to discuss is a salt bag filling process. In this application, empty bags are loaded into a machine where arms will swing down and pick up an empty bag and place it underneath a funnel. Above the funnel, there is a fill bin that will dispense salt.